Chapter 7, Streets and Highways. What's the difference between a road and a street? While there are general guidelines surrounding the differences, they are hardly followed universally. First off, roads and streets are generic terms for thoroughfares that facilitate the movement of people and goods. Historically and in theory, but not always in reality, roads tend to be located in more rural areas and streets in more urban. Both typically intend low-speed vehicle mobility, 25 to 35 miles per hour, 40 to 60 kilometers per hour, as well as access to adjacent land uses. Streets are more likely to have sidewalks, on-street parking, and street furnishings. What's the difference between a street and an avenue? Avenues are similar to streets, but typically wider with more travel lanes, a greater mix of land uses, and even more street trees. Consider the north-south running avenues in Manhattan against the east-west running streets. Based on the Commissioner's Plan of 1811, most avenues in Manhattan have a 100-foot right-of-way, although some, such as Madison Avenue, are smaller and others, such as Park Avenue, are larger. Well, most streets have a 60-foot right-of-way, although a subset of the east-west streets are larger, as in Figure 7.1. Boulevards tend to be even larger than avenues. So while these trends can help us get onto the same page when discussing different types of streets, the sheer number of exceptions makes for a lot of overlap. We also haven't even begun to discuss lanes, drives, alleys, trails, and mews, or highways, freeways, and turnpikes. There are also new terms, such as strode, that speak to our flawed history of street design. The term strode, illustrated in Figure 7.2, coined by Chuck Marone in the Strong Towns Group, describes a street-road hybrid that should have been designed more like an urban street, but veered off into a design more befitting a rural highway. Chuck calls strodes the futon of transportation design, Futons are a hybrid between a couch and a bed, and they end up making for either an uncomfortable sitting or sleeping experience. Similarly, strodes move cars too slowly to be efficient and too fast to make walking, bicycling, transit, or the adjacent land use is all that pleasant. His point isn't simply to define these hybrids. He wants to spark change. If we really want to capture the value of the infrastructure with respect to the private sector in our cities and towns, we need more streets and fewer strodes. 7.1 Highways Today the word highway evokes images of interstates, but the term in engineering and legal parlance is a bit more general. Interstates are indeed highways, such as the Bobby Jones Expressway in Figure 7.3, but when we restrict access and add medians and grade separation with crossing roads, engineers tend to use the word freeway, despite the enormous costs of driving and freeway infrastructure, motorway, or expressway instead. You also might hear them called limited access highways, or if there is a toll, toll roads or turnpikes. Highways, like high streets and cities, are the main routes in contrast with byways, which are secondary, often more circuitous paths. Highways, more generally, can really refer to any public thoroughfare, often but not always for vehicular travel. Typically, we use the term highway for major roads and arterials that join different cities. Access can be limited, but most highways, such as the ones shown below, are at grade with crossing roads and often include driveways to adjacent land uses. This leads to intersections or junctions that are typically not present along freeway corridors. Thus, older, particularly pre-interstate highways, tend to have stoplights and stop signs instead of the interchanges and ramps we build along freeways. Speed limits on highways vary quite a bit depending on context. The same goes for the number of lanes, as well as most other street design features. So in effect, the term highway can apply both to a rural two-lane highway, as well as urban multi-lane highway, figure 7.4. While their designs are completely different, they both fall under the highway umbrella. 7.2 Boulevards The use of the term boulevard has less to do with conventional functional classification and more to do with character. Boulevards tend to be wide streets, typically well above 100 feet, 30 meter right-of-way, in urban areas defined by the prevalence of features such as landscape medians, generous sidewalks, and an abundance of street trees. While most boulevards are indeed larger thoroughfares that probably fall under what engineers would consider an arterial, they often don't function as such. Arterials, by definition, intend to provide a low level of access to nearby land uses and a high level of through mobility. Boulevards sometimes fit this definition, although such roads are probably better known as parkways, but it is not uncommon for boulevards to also serve local accessibility as well as accommodate a variety of other important street uses, walking, bicycling, transit, and lingering via shopping and residential land uses, in addition to public green spaces. Boulevards have a long and distinguished history, dating back to the 1500s when cities such as Amsterdam converted their medieval walls into tree-lined streets. Although Paris did the same thing during the late 1600s, boulevards weren't really in vogue until the City Beautiful movement nearly 200 years later. 
With the likes of Frederick Law Olmsted and others, the U.S. in the late 1800s and early 1900s saw a number of new boulevards and parkways built, as well as what we now call multiway boulevards. Multiway boulevards differ from standard boulevards in that they provide separated facilities within the same right-of-way for through movement of somewhat fast vehicles, 35 mile per hour, 55 km per hour, alongside a slower moving, 10 mile per hour, 16 km per hour, pedestrian friendly environment with on street parking and sidewalks. The combination of high mobility and high land access on the same facility simply does not fit into the traditional functional classification system promoted by the Association of State Departments of Transportation, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, or AASHTO. In other words, the functional classification system essentially divides street types into high mobility, low access, freeways and arterial, low mobility, high access, local streets, or medium mobility, medium access, collector roads. Thus, engineers fail to provide a category for this sort of mixed use street that facilitates high levels of both mobility and access. Due to the rise of functional classification combined with concerns over a high number of potential conflict points, multi way boulevards disappeared from the toolbox of U.S. engineers beginning in the 1930s. This, however, is beginning to change. Figure 7.5 shows the southbound half of Octavia Boulevard, which replaced the Central Freeway in San Francisco. For years prior, advocates pushed to get the Central Freeway torn down, but engineers were extremely wary of the potential for increased traffic congestion. The 1989 World Series earthquake damaged the freeway enough to force closure in what happened in terms of traffic congestion. Nothing. The existing traffic using the Central Freeway either disappeared into the grid, changed modes, changed times, or didn't take the trip in the first place. This result provided enough evidence to secure permanent removal and eventually installation of the first multi-way boulevard in the U.S. in more than 80 years. Now, Octavia Boulevard carries over 45,000 cars per day, while also functioning as a place in itself where people work, shop, play, and live all side by side. Moreover, concerns over conflict points have yet to be realized in terms of worse road safety outcomes. Another use of the term boulevard that is beginning to become more common is the bike boulevard. Bike boulevards, however, look and function quite a bit differently than the boulevards we've been talking about thus far. The idea behind a bike boulevard is to turn a continuous residential street corridor into an extremely bike-friendly route. This usually includes trying to reduce both the volume and speeds of vehicular traffic through the use of diverters and traffic calming. This usually allows for a greater range of bicyclist types to traverse the corridor with a much lower level of traffic stress than most other types of bike facilities, lowering the perceived cost of travel and thus increasing the perceived access. Empirical data from installations usually finds that bike boulevards do not negatively impact the adjacent streets in terms of car traffic or speeds either. Figure 7.6 depicts a bike boulevard in Sydney, Australia. A final use of the term boulevard is the protective grassy strip or planting strip or tree lawn between the street and sidewalk, figure 7.7, where street trees are often planted. This usage, most common in the Midwestern United States, harkens back to the earlier etymology of the word. The series referred to as a verge in Australia, New Zealand, and England, where the sidewalk is termed the pavement or side path or footpath. While boulevards now come in various shapes and sizes, the underlying refrain is a general shift in mindset with regard to the underlying purpose of a street away from moving cars and accessing land. Well-designed streets are places in themselves, and boulevards tend to serve as a great example of the same. Seven point three street furniture. One of the most underappreciated aspects of street design is well thought out street furniture. The term street furniture collectively refers to all the amenities for public use in the right of way, such as benches, bus stop shelters, wayfinding signs, drinking fountains, trash receptacles, mailboxes, police and fire department call boxes, and bicycle racks. Phone booths were once a ubiquitous feature, and perhaps something akin to the internet kiosks in New York City might eventually take their place. Street furniture not only provides for basic utilitarian uses, such as the ability to sit on a bench, but it adds to the visual interest and aesthetics of our street spaces. The presence of street furniture also clues drivers to the fact that they should expect pedestrians in the area. With respect to street design, the area on the edge of the sidewalks between the vehicular portion of the street and where pedestrians walk is called the furnishing zone. This is the space where we typically locate street furniture as well as street trees, plantings, landscape strips, signs, fire hydrants, utility poles, and even cafes. In terms of functionality, the furnishing zone also serves as a buffer between cars and pedestrians. If designed poorly, then the sidewalk becomes an obstacle course, as in figure 7.9b. 
Street furniture is especially important to include along retail streets at transit stops as well as near important buildings and restaurants. However, they should be considered anywhere where we expect or want pedestrian activity. Many cities have also started to transition on-street parking spaces into parklets that provide for an even larger pedestrian realm and more opportunities for street furniture. Parklets, such as the one in Long Beach, California in Figure 7.8, are particularly useful when the sidewalk space is limited and the surrounding land uses are complementary. According to city staff, the adjacent shops in this Long Beach example experienced an increase in sales following the parklet installation and had to hire additional employees. 7.4 Signs, Signals, and Markings Signs, signals, and markings are consistent across the landscape so that driving skills can be transferred spatially between places, making roads more useful and, it is hoped, drivers safer. Road signs in the United States are standardized in the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD. Other countries have similar documents. The history of the evolution of this document is given in a series of papers by Hawkins. Like the networks themselves, signs evolved. From local practice, cities and states copying neighbors, inventing what they needed, and later standardizing first for rural and urban areas separately, then jointly, after the value of coordination became apparent when automobile travelers crossed jurisdictional boundaries. From the first center line in Michigan in 1911 and stop sign in 1915, a 1923 recommendation established the basis of the shapes used for road signs today. This system was improved over time. In 1924, the Minnesota Department of Highways published its Manual of Markers and Signs with the same shapes, but the white background was made yellow. In 1924, the American Association of State Highway Officials, ASHO, later ASHTO, adopted the MVASHD plan with black on yellow. However, red and green on signs were rejected due to lack of visibility at night. The objective of ASHO in those early years was first to inventory all the sign characteristics that had been locally deployed, and then to standardize various aspects, shape, word, color, symbol, and uniformity of erection in application. Even as late as 1930, the third National Conference on Street and Highway Safety published a manual on street traffic signs, signals, and markings that had either white or black paint for concrete and white or yellow paint for bituminous asphalt. A red border and legend on yellow was suggested for stop signs. Separately, standards were being developed for cities. Traffic signals are largely an urban phenomenon. While the date of the first traffic signal is contested, the electric traffic signal appeared in Cleveland in 1914 in the first three-color traffic signal in 1920. Finally, in 1932, a Joint Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices met to rectify and combine the separate ASHO and NCSHS manuals for rural and urban traffic into a complete manual. Main initial points were color codes, signs at night, reduced sign sizes in urban areas. Visibility research was undertaken, sponsored by the Bureau of Public Roads. Minor changes continued after this date, though a modern driver would certainly understand the road at this point. For instance, in the 1954 MUTCD, the stop sign changed from black on yellow to white on red. Yield signs were introduced as a triangle, black on yellow, emulating European standards. 7.5 Junctions When one road meets another, it's a junction. Although we often use intersection as a synonym, Junctions more generally refer to places where people change modes, routes, or directions. Junctions can also be grade-separated interchanges, signalized intersections, roundabouts, protected bike intersections such as the one in Salt Lake City shown in figure 7.11, or one of any number of various types. Historically, places developed around junctions were roads or trade routes intersected. Nine different streets converge at Bank Junction in London, and you can see in figure 7.12 just what this meant in mid-1800s England. The area not only claims home to quite a few notable sites, such as the Bank of England headquarters and Mansion House, home of London's mayor, and one of the busiest underground stations in the city. This sort of development also happened where modes instead of roads intersected. New York City evolved, at least in part, due to its harbor with access to the Atlantic Ocean, the Hudson River, the Erie Canal, and land routes such as the Boston Post Road. Chicago developed because it linked major railroads with inland rivers and canals. So while all intersections are junctions, not all junctions are intersections. 7.6 Conflicts Conflicts refer to traffic situations where road users would crash if one or both didn't break, weave, or make another evasive maneuver. For various reasons, such as the relative infrequency of crashes, the underreporting of crashes, and the chance of incorrect or incomplete crash records, engineers have been using traffic conflicts as a proxy for road safety for more than five decades starting in 1967 with two General Motors researchers. 
Perkins and Harris developed what became known as the traffic conflict technique in 1967 in order to show that GM cars were safer than the cars of other manufacturers. Traffic safety researchers were quick to adopt and refine the techniques as evidenced by the hundreds of published papers on the subject under the supposition, as shown in figure 7.13, that conflicts were associated with crashes and that conflicts could even be used to predict future crashes. Conflicts were categorized by type as well as by severity. They went on to eventually include modes other than the automobile, yet it took nearly 20 years for researchers to significantly associate conflicts with actual crash outcomes. Today, one of the most widely researched and used conflict approaches is the Swedish conflict technique. Still, there have been issues with conflict-based techniques in safety research. The definition of a conflict, or even a serious conflict, has long been up for debate. Even when conflicts are well-defined and observers well-trained, there are inconsistencies in assessing conflicts. The bigger issue has to do with how much conflicts matter in terms of actual road safety outcomes. Today, we have empirical examples of shared spaces and multi-way boulevards that have intentionally and successfully maximized the number of conflicts as a means of increasing safety, applying the theory of risk compensation in reverse. The trick seems to be understanding context when assessing value and meaning with respect to conflicts. Our meaning of conflicts also differs from what we mean by conflict points, which will be discussed in the next section. 7.7 7, Conflict Points Conflict points tell where, within an intersection or along a street, road users would have conflicts with other road users. This means mapping and counting the locations within an intersection, for instance, where road users would be crossing, merging, or diverging with other road users. The theory behind conflict point analysis is that we should minimize them in order to increase safety. For instance, the conflict point diagrams in Figure 7.14 compare the number and type of conflict points for a four-way intersection against a roundabout. The four-way intersection has 16 crossing, 8 merging, and 8 diverging conflict points. The roundabout has 4 merging and 4 diverging conflict points. In terms of safety, the biggest benefit for roundabouts seems to come in the fact that we manage to design out the crossing type conflicts, which can be the most dangerous. And since roundabouts have proven to be generally safer than conventional four-way intersections, we have a winner in terms of conflict point analysis. One problem is that most every conflict point diagram you see doesn't include modes other than cars. Figure 7.15 adds pedestrian conflicts to the mix. Another problem is that we are using conflict points as a proxy for actual road safety outcomes, which doesn't always work out. For instance, the multi-way boulevard, which produces on the order of 64 conflict points, often does so with a better safety record than similarly sized conventionally designed streets. We also consider potential conflict points in terms of street design, particularly with driveways and left-turning vehicles. This leads to what we call access management, which is essentially a set of strategies intended to reduce conflict points and, in turn, conflicts within the built environment. Similarly, the shipping company UPS attempts to minimize the number of left turns that their drivers need to make. In fact, they contend that more than 90% of their turns their drivers make are right turns. While the UPS right turn policy was initially envisioned in 2004 as an environmental effort to reduce gasoline consumption and emissions, with which it has been successful, saving an estimated 30 million miles driven and 3 million gallons of gas annually, it also improves safety. This is the same reason many bus routes in the United Kingdom and other left-hand drive countries use anti-clockwise loops at suburban terminals and in city centers. 7.8. Roundabouts. For most Americans, roundabouts probably fall somewhere on the love-hate spectrum between extreme dislike and hate. One reason for such an unenthusiastic assessment can likely be traced to some common misconceptions about what we are actually talking about when we talk about roundabouts. Having grown up near Boston, Wes spent many Friday evenings on hot summer nights sitting in traffic with everyone else, trying to get to Cape Cod. The Cape Cod Canal cuts the area off from the rest of Massachusetts, so the only way across by car meant traversing one of the two bridges. For years, both bridges also had what those from New England call a rotary on one side or the other, as shown in figure 7.16. Traffic would routinely back up for miles at both bridges, making what could have been a 75-minute drive considerably longer. The culprit was often these multi-lane rotaries. Such intersections proved to be inefficient, both in terms of traffic flow and land consumption, as well as dangerous. You may also remember Clark Griswold getting stuck in a London traffic circle in a 1985 movie, European Vacation. Hey look kids, there's Big Ben, Parliament. 
Homer Simpson was in a similar situation in a 2003 episode and nearly killed the Queen of England. Examples like these end up giving all circular intersections a bad rap. Not surprisingly, circular intersections were phased out of most of U.S. design toolboxes in the minds of many Americans. Modern roundabouts, not developed until the 1960s, refer to something quite different. For one thing, roundabouts are much smaller than the old rotary intersections. Instead of outside diameters exceeding 300 feet, 90 meters, or 400 feet, 120 meters, modern single-lane roundabouts typically range between 90 feet, 27 meters, and 180 feet, 54 meters. Another thing is that the cars entering must yield to the cars already in the roundabout. This was usually but not always the case with the older traffic circles and rotaries. The main defining characteristic of modern roundabouts, however, has to do with speed deflection. Speed deflection refers to angle at which cars enter the roundabout. With the old rotaries, there was little to no horizontal deflection of through traffic, so cars could easily exceed 30 miles per hour, 50 kilometers per hour. A well-designed modern roundabout typically has enough deflection in the angle of this approach to actively manage vehicle speeds to less than 20 miles per hour, or 30 kilometers per hour. It can also still handle truck traffic with design features such as a traversable apron that skirts the inner circle, which can be seen in figure 7.17 from Vancouver. So what does the research tell us about modern roundabouts? In most contexts, they move traffic more efficiently and are safer than conventional intersections. Why would this be the case? In terms of efficiency, there is no waiting for the light to turn green when there is no cross traffic. In fact, single lane roundabouts have been shown to reduce delays as compared to conventional intersections and effectively manage traffic flows as high as 25,000 cars per day. Less idling also means fewer emissions. In terms of safety, roundabouts eliminate conflict points and the most dangerous types of conventional intersection crashes. While you may get more sideswipe or rear-end crashes, such crashes are far less likely to be fatal or result in severe injury. Also, if the roundabout is designed with adequate deflection, these crashes tend to happen at slower speeds. This reduces crash severity to the tune of 78 to 82 percent. Fewer serious injury or fatality crashes as compared to conventional intersections. Roundabouts have further advantages for intersections that are not four-way, as shown in the opening image, as those result in even more delays with signals. They can help enable typologies such as the hex, which are complicated from traditional traffic engineering perspectives. There are valid concerns about pedestrians and bicyclists in roundabouts, but splitter islands, setback crosswalks, and sidewalks when combined with slower vehicle speeds help tremendously. Interestingly, many places allow bicyclists to act either as a vehicle or a pedestrian in a roundabout. Other concerns center on more effectively serving those with impaired vision, which is an issue with most roundabouts, but still better than many other intersection designs due to the lower speeds. While multi-lane roundabouts are unnecessarily used in many situations where a one-lane roundabout would work, multi-lane roundabouts still offer many of the same advantages. Compared to single-lane roundabouts, however, they lose some speed deflection when flows are low, introduce a new crash type, sideswipe crashes due to lane changes, and make things more difficult for pedestrians and bicyclists. You can also include neighborhood traffic circles, which are even smaller than most modern roundabouts in the overall discussion of circular intersections. Figure 7.18 from Berkeley, California combines four-way stop control with a circular intersection. While not quite a roundabout, it is a good example of using a small traffic circle to help manage speeds and improve safety. Compared to signalized intersections, roundabouts are generally less expensive where land is plentiful, more efficient, more environmentally friendly, and perhaps most importantly, safer. Further, you never have to worry about a power outage with a roundabout. While there are legitimate reasons not to use roundabouts in some situations, such as highly unbalanced traffic flows or right-of-way limitations, many get eliminated as an option due to our cultural biases against them. All we are saying is give roundabouts a chance. 7.9 Complete Streets One of the most prolific active, human-powered transport policy movements focuses on completing the streets. For instance, in the U.S., Smart Growth America found the National Complete Streets Coalition in 2005, which has been instrumental in helping pass complete streets legislation, intended to compel street designers to consider all road users in over 1,000 municipalities and agencies and across 33 U.S. states. The underlying goal of a complete streets policy is to compel planning for all modes and all transport projects, but the more commonly held impression is that completing the street means adding design elements like sidewalks, bike lanes, and raised medians to almost every major street. Given the term complete streets itself, this line of thinking is not surprising. So despite the broader intentions, the most visible 
end products of this movement are typically manifested with street design elements intended, as the coalition suggests, to help build roads that are safer, more accessible, and easier for everyone. In addition to improving road safety, the National Complete Streets Coalition highlights other benefits, including higher rates of active transport, less driving, and fewer vehicle miles traveled, as well as better public health outcomes. While the fundamental lessons behind complete streets are important, street-level design elements matter, but they need to be considered in combination with street network design. The premise behind the complete streets movement in terms of planning for all modes is indeed valuable, however, focusing simply on street level, like figure 7.19, without consideration of the network level impacts, and will leave us behind in a position where achieving more sustainable transport behaviors, as well as better road safety and health outcomes, is difficult. In other words, complete streets in an incomplete city don't work. We need both complete streets and complete cities. 7.10. Dedicated spaces. Some places do not allow for pedestrians or bicyclists. When we also have limited access, we call these freeways. Such facilities prioritize the through movement of vehicles. The freeway in figure 7.20 cuts directly through Dallas, Texas, and has a high level of mobility and a low level of land access. This is thought to provide efficiency and safety with respect to moving high traffic volumes at higher speeds. At the other end of the spectrum, we have pedestrian-only streets that generally exclude vehicles. Figure 7.21 depicts the 16th Street Pedestrian Mall in Denver, which allows for pedestrians and buses, but not cars or bikes. Professor Norman Garrick of the University of Connecticut considers such designs, as well as shared spaces where cars would also be allowed, to be on context time. Under context time, the social aspects of the space governs behavior. Thus, such dedicated spaces are multifunctional, culturally defined, personal, diverse, and unpredictable. In contrast, freeways such as the one in Dallas are on system time. Dedicated spaces on system time are single-purpose, regulated, impersonal, uniform, and predictable. There is a time and place for both system time and context time, just like there is a time and place for dedicated spaces that focus on cars and mobility, as well as those that focus on other modes and social needs. Just tell the flip-flop wearing bicyclist, figure 7.22, that riding on the Southeast Expressway in Boston smells like an unwise life decision. 7.11, shared space. Engineers and planners typically design transport systems to isolate different modes of travel as much as possible. Vehicles should stay on the roadway, bicycles in the bicycle lane, and pedestrians on the sidewalk. Some visionary transport engineers and planners seek to do the exact opposite, akin to how we built streets before the automobile, and encourage increasing interactions between different modes by removing horizontal and vertical demarcations, removing all signage, and abolishing the basic rules of the road. By removing what seems to give us order in the transport system, the theory of shared spaces is that we force road users to react to social cues. In other words, when road users enter what for all intents and purposes is an unregulated situation, they must orient themselves to the situation by observing and building upon the order established by fellow road users as opposed to that instituted by externally created rules. The thinking is that this creates more awareness and that perhaps we can achieve even greater order in the transport system. To picture this concept, imagine a public ice skating rink and try explaining to somebody who has never seen one how it works. If you tell them that dozens of people on sharpened metal blades are moving through a confined area at varying speeds and doing so on a surface made of ice, they'd probably picture total chaos. Such chaos, however, rarely fails to materialize. Rather, the lack of rules and demarcation forces skaters to become aware of their surroundings and fellow users, while social cues help skaters modify their paths and avoid collision with other users of the system. Social scientists term this spontaneous order. As with everything, there are good and bad designs. In the context of a street or intersection, it is exceedingly difficult for traffic engineers to give up such control and cede whose turn it is to cross the street to the road users themselves while hoping for order to spontaneously emerge. It seems like we would be setting ourselves up for madness, but similar to the ice skating rink example, it also seems to work in the transport system. Shared space designs primarily undertaken in European and Asian cities, as well as Auckland, New Zealand, have somewhat surprisingly been shown to increase both efficiency and road safety over more conventional designs. Whether this design concept takes off in the rest of the world remains to be seen. 7.12 Spontaneous Priority Shared spaces are streets where all signs, traffic control devices, street markings, and separation of modes have been removed. 
This way of thinking forces all road users, no matter the mode of transport, to take responsibility for their own actions and negotiate the space via all other road users by means of eye contact and other social cues. This is in stark contrast to a conventional street design where modes tend to be separated and movements guided and controlled by traffic signals and the like. In the right context, the result of shared space is not chaos. Instead, spontaneous order takes hold, resulting in a space often more efficient and safer than a conventional design. Shared space is an often misunderstood concept. First things first, the right context is key. Shared spaces would not work everywhere, especially when the focus is mobility and high travel speeds. The surrounding land uses and the way that these buildings and activities interact with the street make a big difference. So does the mix of road users. A street dominated by cars would be hard-pressed to function like we might imagine a shared space would. Many people believe living streets and or Wunerfs to be synonymous with shared spaces. However, these street types specifically grant priority in the street to pedestrians. A true shared space concept does not. Why? Because it doesn't have to. In the right context, this prioritization occurs naturally. Baranchek and Marshall, 2017, analyzed data from 37 shared space intersections with high levels of interaction between pedestrians and vehicles and assessed with which mode acquiesced to which when con conflict arose. When vehicles outnumbered pedestrians while controlling for other design factors, the pedestrians tended to back off and cede the road space to the cars. However, when pedestrians outnumbered cars, this prioritization flipped. Now the cars were the ones yielding to the pedestrians when a conflict arose. The red line in figure 7.24 represents the one-to-one -one ratio of pedestrians to vehicles. What we call the modal dominance index is represented by the size and color of the circles. The green circles signify pedestrian-dominated intersections, while the blue circles represent vehicle-dominated intersections. The size of the circle indicates a higher level of dominance over the shared space. Many shared space designers are tempted to follow the Living Street or Wunerf model and grant pedestrians priority in the street space to the point where there is a call for what is known as Pedestrian Priority Shared Spaces, PPSS. While such designs can be successful and find a multitude of benefits, putting up signs to grant pedestrians priority misses a key point of the shared space concept. A true shared space in the right context doesn't need those signs. 7.13 Directionality Why do traffic engineers seem to like one-way streets so much? The Ashton Green Book points out a handful of efficiency advantages. By removing the delay caused by left-turning cars, we increase traffic capacity and speed. Fewer intersection conflicts means more efficient signal timings and, in theory, fewer and less severe crashes by reducing or eliminating head-on crashes. Medians are no longer necessary, so you can often fit in an extra lane of through traffic, which further increases capacity and speed. More mobility with better safety? What's not to love? Beyond the abundant advantages, Astro lists a few disadvantages as well. There is the potential for increased travel distances in cases when you have to travel almost around a whole block to reach your destination. When all lanes begin to back up at traffic lights, emergency vehicles may be blocked. Lastly, one-way streets may confuse visitors. This leads to wrong-way drivers and head-on collisions, as in Figure 7.28. Given Ashto's list of pluses and relatively few minuses, it makes sense why so many of our streets send traffic in just one direction. Then again, it's not hard to argue what Ashto deems an advantage might be the opposite. If I lived or worked on a one-way street, I'd be pretty hard-pressed to believe that more cars moving at higher speeds is necessarily a good thing. Donald Appleyard's early studies found that many residential livability advantages on two-way streets. But the one-way street he investigated had far more traffic than the two-way comparisons. Denver converted a handful of one-way pairs to two-way operation in the early 1990s and found that residents preferred the change. A recent case study out of Louisville looked at a handful of one-way to two-way conversions and found significant increases in pedestrian traffic, property values, and business revenue. These benefits were accompanied by a significant decrease in crime. Charleston, South Carolina, and Lubbock, Texas also found success in terms of two-way streets helping downtown revitalization. Such livability benefits are all well and good, but are they worth the increased road safety risks that Astro made so clear? The research is beginning to suggest that the safety answer isn't clear. Lubbock found no significant change in terms of traffic flows or safety. Another study from Jerusalem also found no differences in road safety. Despite similar traffic levels on the Louisville conversions, crash rates dropped with the two-way streets. Moreover, child pedestrian injury rates on one-way streets have been found to be more than double the rates on two-way streets. More research is needed on the safety outcomes. However, it is also interesting to ask why the safety benefits of one-way streets would be overblown. First, there are likely to be differences in driver behavior, most notably with faster speeds on one-ways. 
it is pretty easy to understand why slower traffic, despite the noted increase in conflict points, might help reduce crash severity. Another ITE guide even says the following regarding the safety of one-way streets. One-way pairs with good signal progression and high travel speeds seem to elicit red light running behavior. Another example of risk compensation we discussed earlier. Figure 7.26 comes from the ITE Traffic Engineering Handbook. It makes the case for better safety on one-ways by depicting the number of conflict points at an intersection for a two-way street is 32 and for a one-way street is only 5. This is a stark difference that could theoretically result in better safety. Beyond the fact that conflict points are not often well correlated with actual safety outcomes, the bigger issue is that they're comparing apples and oranges. The diagram compares an intersection where all four legs have two lanes, one in each direction, to an intersection where all four legs have one lane. In reality, the one-way streets would have at least two lanes, if not three, as in the image of Denver below, or in cases where a median is removed. One-way streets with multiple lanes is a fairer comparison that would substantially increase the number of potential conflict points and deem the comparison in the image below as relatively meaningless. Moreover, with regard to conflicts, Ashto even suggests converting from two-way to one-way operation in situations where an urban street has too many pedestrian vehicle conflicts. The reduction in pedestrian vehicle conflicts is supposedly derived from a simpler set of intersection movements. The real reason for the reduction of pedestrian vehicle conflicts might be even simpler, fewer pedestrians wanting to cross the street in the first place. So after all that, the only definitive advantage left for one-way streets is increased traffic capacity. Notably, a capacity advantage of one-way streets can reduce barriers to the implementation of protected cycle lanes or bus-only lanes, and cycle-bus contraflow can mitigate the distance traveled implications. However, increased capacity is also up for debate. Taking into account the decreased accessibility of circuitous routes, drivers make significantly more turning movements and travel greater distances given the same origins and destinations in a network dominated by one-way traffic patterns. A network of two-way streets actually has a greater trip-serving capacity, particularly for trips less than five miles, as compared to a network of one-way streets. When also prohibiting left turns in the two-way network, this capacity advantage of the two-way network included longer trips as well. Not only do one-way streets often hinder accessibility and livability, the traffic engineering benefits don't necessarily hold. While one-way streets are still needed when relatively narrow cross-sections prevent two-way traffic, and may be inoffensive on two-lane roads as in figure 7.25. In most other contexts, it is hard to imagine while so many cities continue to preserve wide one-way streets. Some cities are changing their ways. The before and after images on figure 7.27 are from Lar Larimer Street in Denver, where a one-mile, 1 1.6-kilometer stretch was recently converted from a one-way into a two-way. Instead of three high-speed lanes heading toward downtown, there is now one lane in each direction with accompanying bike lanes. With noticeably slower traffic and more active transport use along this corridor, it makes sense why there are so many new businesses seem to be popping up, especially when compared to the parallel streets that remain one way. It might be time for cities to find a new direction, and more research is needed, but it seems like this new direction will run both ways. seven point one four lanes. The portion of the street cross-section typically dedicated to moving traffic is often subdivided into lanes. Each individual lane corresponds to a single channel of traffic, which could include cars, trucks, transit, and or bikes, and is separated from other lanes via lane markings. In general, in each lane, vehicles follow each other in tandem rather than riding side by side, although sometimes skinnier vehicles like bikes and motorcycles split lanes designed for wider vehicles like automobiles. When designing a street, especially a collector or arterial, an engineer typically needs to make decisions regarding how many lanes to provide and how wide those lanes should be. The number of lanes typically come down to considerations such as functional classification, flow, capacity, and level of service. However, deciding upon an appropriate number of lanes should also consider context, surrounding land uses, bicyclists, transit, pedestrians, especially in terms of crossing distances, and safety. The number of lanes on the major streets in a city were consistently and significantly associated with travel behavior, both in terms of mode choice and vehicle miles traveled. Cities with fewer lanes on their major roads have considerably higher rates of active transport and less vehicle travel per capita. Cities with fewer lanes on the major roads also have significantly fewer crashes across all severity levels, including severe injuries and fatalities, holding all other variables constant. Other studies found similar results in terms of more lanes being associated with more crashes. Transport agencies have also started to recognize the efficiency in focusing on moving people rather than cars. In other words, it is difficult to maximize flux within our limited street space 
with single occupancy vehicles when transit and bicycles can move a greater number of people with less lane consumption. In concurrence with determining the number of lanes, engineers also need to establish appropriate lane widths. Many U.S. engineers consider 12 feet, 3.65 meter, lane widths to be standard. The Astro Green Book does not explicitly state this, but does say that 12 foot lanes are desirable in both rural and urban areas. Astro also asserts that wider lanes help in terms of safety, capacity, overall driving comfort, as well as with maintenance costs. They do, however, allow for some wiggle room by saying that lane widths can range from 9 feet, 2.75 meters, to 12 feet. 11 foot, 3.35 meter lanes are acceptable in urban areas with pedestrian crossings or right of way restrictions, which should include almost every urban area. In rural and residential areas, 10 foot, 3.05 meter lanes are acceptable in low speed facilities and 9 feet on low volume roads. Ashto also says that we can use 10 feet or 11 foot widths on the inner lanes of multi lane urban streets when we want to make the outer lanes even wider, 12 feet or 13 feet, 3.95 meters, for bicycle use, although this doesn't exactly make for a great bike facility. So, while 12 foot lanes have become the de facto standard primarily based on safety concerns, the research doesn't seem to concur with this assertion. Overall, the existing literature suggests that generally wider streets result in higher vehicle speeds and negative safety implications. Controlling for posted speed limit, lane widths are mo the most significant factor impacting speeds. In terms of safety outcomes, several studies find worse safety outcomes associated with wider lanes. For instance, no one gathered data from all 50 states over a 15-year time period to study the safety impacts of what we normally label as improvements to our streets. Instead of improving safety, they actually seem to have harmed it. In fact, Noland attributes more than 900 additional fatalities and 60,000 additional injuries to agencies having increased their lane widths. Wider lanes also mean longer pedestrian crossing distance and a negative impact on pedestrian safety. In reality, streets with narrow lanes are still quite common in our older cities, and they continue to function just fine. Figure 7.29 shows a cross-section of a street in Cambridge, Massachusetts with lanes that often facilitate truck traffic, of just 9 foot and 10 foot. Figure 7.30 shows us Acorn Street in the Beacon Hill neighborhood of Boston with a curb to curb cross section of just 6 feet. The standard at the time this was built required streets to allow two cows to pass each other at the same time. So, what do the more informed design manuals suggest in terms of lane widths? NACDO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, recommends 10 foot lanes on any city street with a target speed less than or equal to 40 miles per hour, 65 kilometers per hour. If a street has a high bus or truck traffic, NACDO suggests changing one lane from 10 feet to 11 feet. The analogy of lane width in the rail sector is gauge, spacing between rails and railroad tracks, which determines the widths of trains, tunnels, and so on. This, however, must be more standardized as the train cannot deviate from the track. 7.15 Vertical Separations By 1960, stop-and-go traffic will be a thing of the past. Before he designed the General Motors Futurama exhibit at the 1939 World's Fair in New York, Norman Belgettes designed a similar utopia for Supershell gasoline advertisements in Life magazine, shown in figure 7.31. Belgettes proposed three strategies, quoting from the ad. One, sidewalks will be elevated. You'll walk and shop above Main Street, actually cross over it. Two, local traffic will use the full width of the streets below. No sidewalks, no parked cars. Loading and unloading will be done inside the buildings. And three, high-speed, long-distance traffic will have its own elevated one-way lanes, no stoplights or intersections. The underlying premise of this Belgetti's quote is that our city transport systems will essentially become three-dimensional, or have what we call vertical separation. By separating modes and eliminating as many intersections as possible, we could theoretically increase capacity and efficiency. We tried this at least to some extent in cities such as Atlanta with pedestrian bridges, commonly known as gerbil tubes, as shown in figure 7.32, due to their resemblance to habit trails, that help people traverse multiple blocks without ever setting foot on the street. Due to land use patterns and issues such as induced demand, vertical separation didn't solve Atlanta's congestion problems, nor provide much downtown street life. However, vertical separation is beneficial in other situations such as Minneapolis's Skyway Network or Montreal's Indoor City on frigid days or the over and underpasses along a freeway. While the big dig tunnels in Boston may have had few cost overruns and may not have solved congestion, they helped reclaim more than 27 acres, 11 hectares of land for public use, which is unheard of for a major, mature city. We can't underestimate what underground subways have done for cities around the world, or even cities such as Boulder, Colorado, shown in figure 7.33, 
that have taken to building short underpasses so that pedestrians and bicyclists can cross their major roads unimpeded. From a safety perspective, removing pedestrians from conflicts with cars must logically reduce the likelihood those pedestrians are in collisions. However, the safety in numbers effect suggests the remaining pedestrians will be less safe as a result. Elon Musk, founder of PayPal, Tesla, and SpaceX, recently announced that he has grown tired of Los Angeles traffic congestion and has literally started digging under his SpaceX campus. Musk says, You have tall buildings. They're all 3D, and then everyone wants to go into the building and leave the building at the same time. On a 2D road network, that obviously doesn't work, so you have to go 3D either up or down, and I think probably down. His initial goal is to improve our tunneling technology with a better boring machine and then to eliminate traffic congestion. While he might be falling into the same old super shell Futurama trap with respect to induced demand, he plans on taking things at least a few levels deeper with his boring company. If you think of tunnels going 10, 20, 30 layers deep or more, it is obvious that going 3D down will encompass the needs of any city's transport of arbitrary size. Our history has shown us that vertical separation is useful in many situations, but is also not appropriate for every context. We'll have to wait and see on this vision of extreme vertical separation. 7.16 Parking Capacity Cars are at rest nearly 23 hours per day. Parking interplays with access in several ways. First, for car travelers, the distance between parking and the final destination can be a major component of total travel time, and so difficult parking reduces access by car. Second, the cost of parking plays into a full-cost approach to access combining time and money cost. Third, space devoted to parking cannot be devoted to other activities, and thus reduces the effective density of activities. How much parking is there in a city such as Minneapolis? This is not a question for which there is a well-sourced answer. The Target Center, the downtown arena home to the Minnesota Timberwolves NBA basketball team, said that there are nearly 25,000 parking spaces and 38 parking lots and ramps throughout downtown. The Minneapolis Municipal Parking System has 17 parking ramps and 7 lots. These ramps and lots encompass over 20,000 parking spaces. In the city, there are 7,000 metered spaces, mostly in commercial districts, including downtown and elsewhere in the city. Outside of downtown requires more estimating. On-street unmetered parking? The city has 1,670 kilometers, 1,100 miles of streets. Most are residential and have on-street parking. We can assume about 120 spaces per kilometer. If there were no parking restrictions, this gives us 220,000 on-street spaces, the vast majority of which are unmetered. Off-street private parking? There are 155,155 households. If each has one off-street space, some have two or three, some have zero, that would be 155,155 off-street spaces in residential areas. That doesn't even count off-street parking at businesses, schools, stores, etc. Roughly every car has to have a space at home, work, and shop. In short, there is a lot of parking.